Hi, my name is Matt. <laughs> it is uh, an absolute joy for me to be here this morning uh, for these historic Perkins lectures. The uh, legacy and the conversation that uh, y'all have been having and nurturing in this place since 1943 is absolutely wonderful. And I'm uh, honored and humbled to be a part of this. Uh, I want to thank the Perkins family, the Yeager family, the Prothrow family, all those who continue to nurture the vision um, and the mission of the church, to Bishop McKee, who has been a wise mentor and friend, to those folks that are gathered here from the TMF and uh, Tom Locke and those others, to John McCarty for his friendship and hospitality in this place. Um, I've known about this church for years. In fact, when I was a kid, um, I've had uh, two experiences in, in this church. My father was in the garment business in Dallas, and his uh, part of his territory was uh, Wichita Falls. And occasionally, he let me come with him and write orders uh, for him, as they used to do in the old days. And on Sunday, we were here, and so we came to this church. And as a little boy, I worshiped uh, in the sanctuary. And then when my youth group, my youth choir, uh, was on a choir tour uh, uh, from Dallas, uh, my youth group stopped in here and, uh, and we, we sang um, here as well. And so uh, it's really odd to be back preaching. I never would have thought of that, uh, that that would have happened. Um, the title of my lectures is Tenacious Solidarity. It's how Walter Brueggemann translates the Old Testament, uh, the Old Testament word hesed, this, this rich word that it's hard to translate, that uh, when the English comes to translate it, they try to stick a lot of words in there. Um, this is the way that um, um, Psalm 63 is translated. Your loving kindness, your hesed is better than life. The tenacious solidarity speaks of God's posture in the world, God's love in redeeming the world. It expresses his relationship with Israel and particularly with those on the edge, the widow, the orphan, the immigrant, the stranger. God's tenacious solidarity is expressed in the very life of Jesus who is emptied and connected into the world. And then in Pentecost, the spirit of the living God being poured out on all flesh. My hope in that these coming hours and time together that we can be renewed in this mission of God in the world. This God that meets us at the bottom of our lives, that speaks our name with a gentleness that, um, that is unarming and disarming, that will never let us go. Will you pray with me? Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. What made Moses Moses is his willingness to turn aside. I have a friend named Charles Rotrammel who 30 years ago was a young burgeoning undergraduate at Rice University. He was a political science major whose academic and social standing opened up really the world to him. Um, and any number of uh, law schools that he was applying to um, accepted him. He had his dreams ahead of him. He had his ambitions ahead of him. He was well on his way of making his mark, making a name for himself, money, prestige. He was on the threshold of it all. And in the final semester of his senior year, he presented his thesis, a subject which centered around a vacuum within the Juvenile Justice Center in Harris County. His thesis proposed a bridge of services in this kind of vacuum that did not exist, that would have addressed what is called the school to prison pipeline, infractions that students incur in public schools that lead to alternative education centers that then move kids into juvenile uh, justice centers and then really uh, move them quite succinctly into um, real prison time. It's a pipeline that is determined by a kid's zip code more than any other determining factor. And his project was enlightened. It was creative. And as they say in baseball, it was purely academic. During the defense of his thesis, an aged and retiring professor took off his glasses, leaned back against his chair and said to Charles, son, are you saying to me that nothing like this exists in Harris County? 
in any form. Yes, sir, Charles responded. Are you saying that if it did exist, if this bridge service did exist, that it would um, positively socially buffer untold number of kids that are at risk in our very city, that would help the marginalized youth, that it would create um, community and resources for under-resourced kids in our, in our city? Yes, sir, he answered. Charles told me that then the professor paused for what seemed like an eternity. And then breaking the silence in the room, he said, son, why don't you go do this? There are any number of people that will be waiting and able to fulfill your slot in any number of the law schools that you've gotten into. But who will do this? Who will take up this? Who will create this? What this professor said to him not only stopped Charles in his tracks, but it kept him up at night. It haunted him for a month. He couldn't shake loose of it. When he woke up in the morning, it was as if this statement and this question was waiting for him. You can change something that needs to be changed in the world. Why don't you go do this? So Charles did. He did it. Charles turned aside. And what made Charles Charles was his willingness to turn aside. Now Charles runs the largest gang prevention program in the state of Texas, a group called Revision. Thousands upon thousands of lost and adjudicated forgotten kids have entered a community together. He with a new generation of leaders are literally transforming the school to prison pipeline, erasing, eradicating punitive measures in schools that land kids in alternative educational systems and then push them towards real prison time. And if he was here today, he would tell you that 80% of all prisoners in the state of Texas, Texas did not finish high school. Education, community, social emotional learning have become a mission for Charles. And it's impacted not only the juvenile justice system, it's impacted our city, and it's now beginning to impact our nation. The school of prison pipeline, this young leadership team in Harris County, well, they're eradicating it. They're doing something about it. They're pushing for policy for sure, but they're also creating systems and structures and redemptive communities that are embedded in churches across Harris County that reflect the tenacious solidarity of God, God's faithfulness. The kids are being let out of bondage and real community is being created. And what made Charles Charles is his willingness to turn aside. Four years ago, Charles asked me if I would take to lunch this uh, 30-something-year-old kid that had grown up in revision. And so I, um, I took this kid named Marlon Lazama to lunch. And this lunch began a rich and improbable friendship that has altered the trajectory of my own life. Marlon uh, told me the story about growing up in El Salvador in an alcoholic family in the midst of a civil war. His dad was mostly absent but when his dad drank, he became quite violent. Marlon has a scar on his face, and I asked him about it early on. He said to me, oh, that's when my dad put a cigarette out on my face when I was eight years old. He was drunk, and he was angry at me. There are cigarette burns all over this boy's body for when his dad got angry. Over the next few years, the violence in his family and his country escalated when he was 14, Marlon and his mother and his two brothers fled their father and fled El Salvador, and they found safe haven in Houston, Texas. And Marlon was in and out of trouble. He always had gangs that were kind of looming in the distance. Someone took him to revision, to a community, and he flourished there. He belonged there. He was introduced to a group of friends now 20 years on that he has contact with every day of his life. And last year, I sat in a classroom full of kids amid of a creating writing program that Marlon and I started out of St. Paul's United Methodist Church called Iconoclast Artists. We are now in 22 schools in both HISD, Spring Branch ISD, and Galveston ISD. And we are involved in five lockdown units. One of those lockdown units specializes in young girls that had been involved in sex trafficking. 
This is an initiative that takes its inspiration from the Wesleyan movement a hundred or so years ago that got busy building hospitals, creating alternative schools and educational systems for kids that were caught up in the industrial revolution that opposed slavery, that helped transform the penal system. And in this under-resourced school where 30% of the kids read below a third grade level, Marlon began to talk about the scars in his own life, the trauma that he had experienced, the kids that had similar experiences. He talked about the abuse and the shame, and he talked about then the improbable places that love goes to find us, the necessity of hope in our own lives, and the way that love encouraged him, summons him to welcome his own wounds and then the power of community. And in this hardened earth, tears began to pool in all of our eyes around the circle. And Marlon said to this group of kids in a forgotten school in a declining school district, I have learned to welcome my wounds. I'm learning to play, I'm learning to to let love into the places that I need it the most. After all, how can I help heal your wounds if I have not welcomed my own wounds? And somehow in this classroom, these black and brown kids everywhere, it became holy ground. I felt like I needed to take my shoes off. And here is this burning bush of a boy, a boy on fire. Common sense tells us that he should have been consumed an abused kid at the hands of an alcoholic father, a child that should be lost to the system, eaten up by poverty and trauma. But somehow, against all probability, he is not being consumed, but he is bearing witness to a light that is stronger than darkness, a love that is stronger than hate. How can this be? Let us turn aside and look at this mystery. And I promise that day as I sat in that classroom Marlon speaking, my own tears streaming down my face. I could hear an ancient voice, much stronger, much deeper, much older, whispering in this classroom, a hair, a share, a hair. I am becoming who I am becoming. I am that I am. The very voice of God in a deserted wasteland of a forgotten school among disposable kids. I am that I am. Jewish theologian Aviva Zornberg says that the name of God can be translated as you will know me by my actions in the world. Stephen Verney, an Anglican theologian, says that the name of God can be translated as something is happening. Often in the church, we have forgotten that it is the world that is the activity of God. It is the world that God loves, that God gives himself to, that God graciously and yes, tenaciously stands in solidarity with. Among the burning bushes of people everywhere that are burning yet not consumed, bearing witness to a God that will not let this world go. And the invitation of the church is to turn aside to participate in the happening of God in our world. The French philosopher Emmanuel Levinas was fierce in his insistence that all philosophy, all of religion could be stripped down to their primitive forms. And he suggested in this way that Yahweh's dealing with Israel, this primitive form was the insistence that human relationships, the common good, communities that span the boundaries of division among societies are the very dwelling place of the divine. Levinas would say that you strip it all down to its core from top to bottom. It's a new humanity that Yahweh is after. Social relationships ordered differently that becomes the mission of God. The creed is always community. It's always kinship that God longs to bring his people into Yet this turning aside, I don't know about for y'all, but for me, it's a difficult process. The word for turning aside is an equivalent uh, in Hebrew for the New Testament metanoia, which has been poorly translated as repentance. It's simply turning around and walking in a new direction. 
But what is at the heart of metanoia really is a new way of seeing. It's a new way of imagining. It's a, it's a, it's a way of seeing that shifts and changes every other way of seeing. It reorients radically one's life what one's does, the way that we understand information and relationships and what we do with our life, and it liberates us into a new direction. Thomas Kuhn, in his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolution, suggests that this new way of seeing is called a paradigm shift. And in this shift, everything changes. All ways of relating and orienting are redesigned and reconfigured. New ways of living are opened up in ways that used to be shut down. A few years ago, my son, Miguel, who was 12 at the time, and I were talking about something that his brother had done that he was upset with, and he said this to me, the way he does things is just stupid. <laughs> and I quite unsuccessfully was arguing that his brother had his own way, was operating from a different system to which Miguel replied, yeah, well, his system is just stupid. <laughs> I was dealing with the vocabulary of a preteen, so I got on Google, um, which is where all of us find all of our deepest answers, and pulled up that old duck and rabbit optical illusion. You know, the one that when you look at it one way, all you see is a duck, and then you see on the other side a rabbit. And I asked him, Miguel, what do you see? And with the incredulousness that only a preteen can muster, he looked at me and he said, it's a duck dad, <laughs> the implied, you stupid, stupid man. <laughs> and I said, are you sure? And he said, yes. And I said, well, just keep looking. And then he said to me, dad, I could look at this image all day long and it would still be a duck. And then slowly with my fingers and not saying much, I began to point out this other image that was also embedded within this primary image. And his eyes began to widen, like I was performing some kind of dad voodoo magic. And he looked at me and he said, oh my. He was freaked out. Dad one, preteen zero. <laughs> it's these small victories, right? You know, we hang on to them. <laughs> Something that had always been there, now being revealed in a new way, a new way of seeing, a way of seeing that cannot be unseen. This is Thomas, three years into Jesus' ministry, unable to grasp it all. The, resurrection, uh, the resurrected body of Jesus now appearing before him, something that is being sustained even when it should be and should have been consumed. My Lord and my God. And this is the entire call of the biblical witness not to rationally assent to propositional statements about who God is, but to enter into an entire new way of seeing in our life, a new way of being in the world, which alters how we live, who we trust, where, are, where we place our allegiance, who we are called to love and build community among. And this is where Moses is because leaving Egypt is going to be deeply difficult because Moses and Israel's entire imagination has been in bondage to Pharaoh. That's where the food is. That's where jobs are. That is where viable technology is. That's where all visible and potential, potential viable life is. And the whole of the Old Testament is a people that continue to struggle with the imagination that has been formed by scarcity, by desire for certainty, by dependence on material wealth. And the relentless voice of Yahweh continuing to call them to trust, to turn aside, to move in a new direction. And this is where Moses is, and he turns aside. And as he turns aside, a new verse, a new voice emerges from the bush saying, I've seen the suffering of my people. I've heard their cry. I know what's happening. I'm not a distant God. I see what's going on. This is the tenacious solidarity of God, the hesed of God that moves towards the suffering of the world. And the ensuing exchange between Moses and Yahweh is an extraordinary encounter. Jewish Midrash says that this exchange takes place and unfolds over about eight weeks. This is not a quick conversation. 
This is about a two-month process, an argument between God and Moses. And amid it, God becomes quite angry with Moses. I think this is very significant because it often represents the problem that God faces in trying to redeem people. It's not just the problem that God has with powers and principalities and pharaohs and empires and folks out there, but it represents our hearts, this kind of resistance to participate by giving ourselves to the world that God loves. And it requires us to face a new direction and to move in new ways of being that although pro- that, that, that um, upset and disorient our lives, Often the problem that God faces is an unwillingness of his own people to turn their back on systems that no longer require faith but compliance and to cultivate alternative practices of our social relationships that are ordered differently, that bear witness to a God that stands with and among a suffering world. Part of Moses' protest is that there is something wrong with his speech. He uses the word in Hebrew, kav peh, which means heavy mouth, heavy tongue. It's the same word that the Torah uses to describe the hardness of Pharaoh's heart. So in very distinct ways, Moses' resistance is impervious, is closed off. Moses has a deep sense of not opening himself up to this new way of seeing, to the word of God, to the extent that he is willing to forego the redemption of God's people simply because he doesn't know if he wants to. Because of the belief, I don't got the gifts. I'm not the right person for this. And so Yahweh sticks at it and finally Moses relents and turns aside. And Moses became Moses when he turned aside. Often in the church, we conceptualize Christianity as an evacuation plan for the faithful. The church is a place to get to so we don't get any of the world's stuff on us. It's a place to leave behind. Our own privatized notion of holiness makes us feel like the whole of Christianity is who can um, leave the game with the whitest shoes possible. The temptation of church is always to believe that somehow we can find a safe enclave away from the pain and the suffering of the world. But my friends, faith will always interrupt our world. Faith will always stop us short. It always beckons us to turn aside to a world that God loves, to see the world differently. And if the name of God can be translated as something is happening, then we must turn towards the happening of God in our world, be drawn into it and ask, God, what are you doing in our world and how might I participate? We are a Pentecost people. We proclaim in our creeds that the spirit of the living God has been poured out on all flesh, has been emptied out on the world regardless of creed or color or social location or nationality. So it is the world that becomes the location of God's divine activity. And to the degree that we are found in solidarity with the world that God loves is really to the degree that we become the church of Christ. German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer so soberly suggests that the church becomes the church of Christ. When we stand in the world, loving the world that God loves, when it's found on the margins of the world, not defending its own reputation, giving itself to the world, attending to the world in all of its needs. The building and the sign in front of our churches, he might suggest, represent a great possibility, not a foregone conclusion. But often the church acts as if it is a location of divine activity and it conceptualizes itself then as the gatekeepers And in doing so, our approach to evangelism has often been, we've got it, you need it, how about it? (laughs) Yet if the spirit of the living God has been poured out on all flesh, then the happening of God is in the world, reconciling the world to God's self, asking us to span boundaries that will make each one of us feel uncomfortable, 
giving up our own privilege, becoming friends with people and intimately connected to people who are very different than us. There are burning bushes everywhere in our world. There are marlins everywhere in our world. People that should be consumed that are not. That the spirit of the living God is doing something in their lives and around them. And we as a church are called to turn aside and to participate in that. I've seen these burning bushes. Parents who have lost a child to gang violence who now volunteer with disaffected youth. A woman that I know very well that was an incest victim in her own family that now has given her life to hold the hands of other women who are found in the same situation, bringing hope and presence in the midst of a demonic place. The alcoholic who at the bottom of his life realizes that the threshold to a new life is on his knees under a word called surrender. It's this immigrant kid, Marlon, who is making a way for other kids through his own scars, his own woundings. Something is happening. These are the ones that oblige us to turn aside as if a bush burning yet not consumed to participate in the hesed of God and the tenacious solidarity of God. And I believe if we're quiet enough this morning, we might hear the voice of our master echoing down the corridors of time and eternity saying, if you love your life, you will lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you will find it. Turn aside, turn aside, turn aside. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.